The Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. I think we're going to start the reading again because we do have open readers and we want to give Ricky a chance to finish. So, uh, Ricky Zuckerman. <laughs> Thank you. Did you enjoy your break? Yes. This first poem I'm going to read is called The Gift. The wizard is rummaging deep in his white sack. There's a poem in here for you somewhere, he says. He pulls out a bright blue glossy package, beribboned, glittering. The card glimmers 100% for you, from me, no preservatives. You open your present slowly, a faint smile on your lips. First, oceans of white tissue paper, then, rising from foam, a tiny animal which steps into your open palm and shakes its white forelock, then strikes its silver hoof three times in your palm and gently touches your fingertip with its pale horn. Glancing up, you say, whose reality is this? When you look down again, your palm is empty. Where is my palm? You ask. The next, pe the next poem I'm going to read is an audience participation poem. And uh, if you choose not to participate, you are forgiven ahead of time. However, it would be wonderful if you all involved yourself in it. And it's really a very simple thing that you have to do. The hard part is listening to me do my part and keeping up what you have to say simultaneously. And here's your part. Are you ready? And um, this would be the whole room. I'm not going to break it up into two-part harmonies. And here's your part. Uh, I'll say it to you once, and you can say it back to me, and we'll see if you're ready. Okay. Avocado, cado, cado, avocado, lust. That's your part. Okay? Try it. A little faster. Now, don't stop until I go like this later, okay? All right, start. Ode to avocados, a chant for mouth and stomach. I must, yes, must have my avocado now. If I wait another second, I'll burst, I'll bust. Avocado lust must have my avocado. Avocado lust must have my avocado. Avocado just won't let me be when that avocado lust sweeps over me. Avocado lust must have my avocado. Avocados and tomatoes, avocados and bread, avocados and potatoes, avocados, I said. Thank you. You were wonderful. <laughs> uh, I'm going to explain one term in this poem, which is uh, the nickname of a restaurant in uh, Buffalo. Actual name of the restaurant is Town Restaurant, but it serves Greek food and has various nicknames amongst the regulars who hang out there. The Greeks, the Greek Ateria, Souvlaki Heaven. So there's just a reference to the Greeks at the beginning. Okay. This is called Charlie at Sunrise. At the Greeks, scant minutes before dawn's red-eyed arrival, I noticed the freckles on Charlie's arms, our conversation punctuated by deliveries of spoons and coffee. Friendship's dawn spreads around us a rose-tint glow, freckled with sudden sparks of laughter. I tell him about falling in love with men I see walking down the street for just one moment of devouring eye intake. 
Perfection at high pitch for a microsecond. Perfect stranger, perfect lover, perfect silence, perfect fantasy. His souvlaki poised in midair. Charlie smiles, remembering the same sort of moment with women he's seen but will never meet. Years ago, I watched with love glazed eyes as Charlie sang in a band with his eyes shut tight in concentration, ecstasy transfiguring his face like a mystic. But I do not tell him. I am sitting with my own myth, a red-headed Adonis. Never expected he would converse with mere mortal. Well, I certainly don't mention, through bites of Spanakopita, that he has been a surprise. Watching Charlie sip his coffee, and gently cradle the warm cup. My first revelation of his radiance returns. He was leaning on a littered countertop, tending bar, and listening just then to a drunk patron, as intensely as he listened to a note within. This is what the Buddha meant by opening the heart. No deaf ear ever, finely tuned tenderness turns around from the cash register like some rare orchid expecting no favor for its extraordinary violet rush, white firelight pouring out from his chest, laugh crinkled corners of eyes, morning sunflower smile, all grace shining through. This is called Grandma's Apartment. On the bureau, faded sepia print, soft-faced the same, but unlined, framed by waist-length brown braids, unraveled, the tortoise-shell combs laid out on the lace, the long, long tresses, long ago, laid out in tissue paper, in a box, in the closet, where cloth from grandfather's business is laid out in piles, the smell in there like deepness could breathe it in forever. Yes, I have a Chinese silk pajama case filled with his kerchief. Yellow, black, red, gold sequins laid out on some. Grandma took me to the factory and we took lots of things away with us, like those handkerchiefs, after he died. For years after, her eyes would fill with tears when her stories, told in English, sequined with Russian and Yiddish, would come round to his name his memory laid out on the cobwebs of old love. Change of pace. <clears throat> Sardines. Rewinding the key, re-rolling the tin, closing it up again. No trace of the taste of sweet tomato, or the salty sea kiss, or the crest of waves anymore. Only rancid fish oil. Rewinding the key, re-rolling the tin, sealing up the sardines. I would rather swim alone in the great sea than be stuck in the can with you. <laughs> Double pillows. Someone once said, the state of your bedroom mirrors your love life. Is that why? The lumps of clothes like piles of old lovers, the dust in the corner like old pain hanging around. The wide open, bright spot of bed like a hopeful vigil that love will come with double pillows like love might stay. The antique patch quilt where maybe love will lie long enough to grow old and comfortable. This poem is called Ostinato. I'm going to take a second to explain that term for those of you who are not musically inclined or who are but have never heard that term. Um, ostinato, I guess you could say it's um, in a musical composition when uh, a theme returns later in the piece sort of a variation on a theme, but it may be slightly altered when it returns, but it's recognizable. Ostinato. Uh, disclaimer. 
this is, um, well, I don't think I need a disclaimer. Other people have read poems without disclaimers. Okay, right to it. Astronado. My knees are Siamese twins. They will not, they will not come apart, come apart. He knows there are switches on my thighs and a fuse box nestled in my neck where he fits against mine. There is time. The skin adheres, fuses into one skin. Joined at the waist, joined at the hips, will not come apart. More Siamese twins. The title of this poem is The Wind. I'm not real good with titles. The wind in trees, a feast for ears and eyes, taught Eve to sway, first sensuous caress, merely a mimic, a body moving closer to and farther from, imitates this undulation. Almost inaudible laughter, earth delight trilling, and the louder tremble of longing. Leaf to breathe, whisper and coo, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Playback. A moment slips off the shelf and rattles around. All the dominoes fall down. The scenario is stuck on rerun. No one sits it. No incision necessary to survey the contents, just peel back the scalp, spilling unraveled reels of frenzied film, dream entangled with breath, gyroscope spiraling laughter, elsewhere soundless moving mouths, peel back the cranium emptying, stolen shadows, silent screams, greedy thalamus gorges on whispers which shiver the tiny cilia on the nape of the neck. A blue electric moan, edged with pale phosphorus, crackles across the retina. This is a poem I wrote uh, after visiting Manhattan last year, in the summer. Manhattan bus ride poster. Gunther Gorgeous has a leopard skin collar, complete with tail and snarling fangs, leather straps across his chest. Gunther Gorgeous has a live leopard draped around his neck. The Hindus say, if your heart is pure, you can walk through a jungle full of wild animals unscathed. So Gunther must be golden through and through, a Francis Assisi in the circus world. Yeah. He's all the sumptuous men I've never known. Virile, virile, virile. Gunther, come and pay me any time. I don't know why poets spend a lot of time deciding what they're going to read ahead of time, because once you get up here, it always changes. Them. The Dark Moth. I am like the dark moth. Few see the golden dust on my wings or the silver circles I fly, drawn closer and closer to the light. I fly silver circles, a slave to the beauty in the vision of the light. I would be the light. My wings flutter, I arch, I build cathedral shrines in the air, one silver circle at a time edifice of secret passions, the light, my father, the light, my mother, the light, my lover. I am the dark moth, adrift from my old cocoon. I fly silver circles, searching for the glow of love. I will spin a dizzy spiral in the warm splash of sun. Advice for the hair on the use of paws. That's not these kind of paws.
pause, that pause patience. In an ordered universe, there is no room for sloppy edges. Precision and step and gait, sprint and gain, sprint and gain. No agony, no time for icicles to form, nor thaw to move to bloom. The patch green beneath the tree is the place of rest, not in the crook of arms nor curve of brow. Ignore twitching, time enough, more time. Linger a second, the lost race will hold less bitterness. The victories ripen like new apples lean into a season. The uncautious are lulled into sleep, but everything is precisely in place. Lean into the hours with open eyes fixed on light. Observe the orchestration here, now. Perfect understanding, lacking only for perfect practice. Discretion. Um, in Buffalo, I uh, do poetry reading sometimes with a local musician who's written music for some of my poems, and I'm used to having him do a sort of bass line behind me on this, so try to imagine it. Um, Joy didn't mention this before she read some of her pieces, but there's a tradition in beat poetry called jazz poems that's very cadenced. And uh, with that in mind, I had that in mind when I was writing this poem. Discretion. Gonna grow me a thin heart candy shell, cover over my thick chocolate soft with a sweet, shiny, cool to touch. No one looking at us will know about that creamed cocoa underneath, waiting for your lips. No one passing us on the street will suspect how our two go together, never sever. Not friend nor foe will ever guess a thin candy shell hides our hot chocolate mess that melts in the hands and melts uh -huh, in the mouth. <laughs> Thank you. The uh, last poem I'm going to read is called When Rubens Returns. I watch them, lithe and lean. I, me, with my excessive anatomy. Their petite repleteness, splendiferous in minuteness. Are their waists really the size of my ankles? But they don't know. When Rubens returns, the shoe will fly to their feet. They will be the ones packaged incorrectly, gaunt and angular, unmatched to pink expanses of flesh and warm, full folds. When Renoir cracks open the Titian white once again, my untanned voluptuousness will reign in purple majesty. Long shall they live, the full-bodied women. Thank you. Today we're going to have uh, the open reading, and, and at the beginning of the open reading, I'd like to have uh, some students of Linda Nockhamson. Uh, Linda Nockhamson teaches a creative writing class here, and uh, some of her students have begun to write poetry, and so five of the students are here today, and I'm going to call them up one at a time to read one of their poems. Uh, Sabrina Melvin. vacation, lying on the sand in the Caribbean, a cool fresh drink in the blazing sun, fingerprints appear around the cold sweating glass, figures of eight 
apostles gave the figures of eight. Slowly, slowly, unrested waves motioned closer before me. I have opened my mind. Joe Tucker. Good afternoon, everyone. This poem was entitled The Road to Damascus. <clears throat> While traveling the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, I came upon a stranger sitting upon a rock. His robes were made of the finest of cloth, and by inspection I could see that he was a man of means. Although I had never looked upon his face, I felt as though I'd known him throughout my existence, and indeed I had. Upon approaching him, I stopped and said, Good day, sir. And he replied, How does one know that the day is good? if he has not seen its end. With this I responded, I need not see the end of this road, yet I know it will take me to Damascus should I follow this path straight and true. And as sure as I know these things, I know that should a man follow that good path upon which he sets out at the dawn, surely he will have a good day, as he shall realize success at his journey's end. So, in light of this, again, sir, I bid you a good day. At this, the stranger looked at me in bewilderment, his eyes filled with consternation, and said, Do you not know to whom you speak? Are you not aware of my origin? I am the tax collector, and it is on this day that many men shall be held accountable for their deeds. And on this day, all in that number shall have a balance struck on their ledger pages. And unto him I replied, Indeed, I know of thine origin. For as sure as you are the tax collector, it is I who hath made your existence possible. For I am the chief magistrate. And indeed, you are most correct. Today is most assuredly the day of accounting, not for all men, but for thee. Thank you. David Cardell. This poem's entitled Split Tree. Big tree, growing tall. Spring through winter, you live through it all. Getting bigger to fall. Spring brings life to you. God gives you leaves to be lonely no more. Summer they age to live on you. Getting tired of hanging around, getting ready to split to another town. Autumn is the time they realize they've been blown off for so long. They must be gone as the tree mourns with a lonely look in the eye. Winter the tree isolates itself to cry. It is, for it is alone, all its leaves have gone. Move aside for man's hands, make the path that goes across the land. Destroying everybody until they realize every somebody is a tree. A man falling down, an acorn in the ground. Every tree is linked to a dead man's body. Every man is actually a tree. Every leaf on the tree is a friend who used to be. Every true friend you ever had is a limb on the tree. At the end of that limb is the end of a true friend. When you're a dying old man, or an aging old tree, when you're a big tree grown very tall, an old man with many friends. In your forest, far away from you, you hear a clinkling sound. A man come from town. With his metal axe in hand, he chops at you with mighty blasts. Until you hit the ground, laughing, he says, another man falling down. Thank you. Lisa Watson.
charge for the fear. You know when to ride my cab. I know where to find you. I am unexpected, yet never late. I already know your destination. I either ride you uptown or downtown. If you're not on the streets, I come to your home. I'm always on call. The ride can be short or long. I'm a silent cabbie. Of course my cab is black. I think you know who I am. Yes, you are next. You think I'm early, but I'm not. You happen to be in for a long, slow ride. Nancy McShane. Hello, my poem is called Advice. Um, a dead heaven of fire and hate. A monster threatening to spit fire. A car with four flat tires lying in the Atlantic Ocean and sinking slowly. Not knowing if you want to turn left or right. Get out of love, it hurts too much. That was very good, and I hope we'll have more of, of uh, Professor Nockham's and students uh, at other poetry readings. Um, uh, now we'll have our, our standard open reading, and uh, Lois Van Houten is the first poet. Going to bed with animals. I sleep in my thicket of bones my animal curled inside. Small cat purrs in the curve of my back. We rock in the kingdom of beasts, where all bed down together or wake to fury of teeth and claw. All day in my body bag inside its truss of flesh, I speak to the growling one. Sit, lie down, be human if you can. Then night with its heavy mouth and tones, be free now, dream of petaled things or bloodies, but cling always to the other one. Savor its warmth, its love, its company, for part of you forever moves in the deep forest of your brain with animals. And coming to terms with geese, which will be published next year in Stone Country. This goose balanced on one foot, this perfect equilibrist, this day's merry-go-round of sunstripes and waterfowl, this moment breakable, curiously refractive, light poised like plexiglass over a fishbowl, these geese paddling a world on edge, ourselves clutching a clump of daffodils, trying to solace, make peace, with our bleak and dangerous hearts as we ride the carousels, ring the bells, leaving a trail of tiny bones, a trace of featherless bodies. Thank you. Juanita Tobin is the next poet. There's an old saying that the soup spoon cannot taste the soup that it carries, but somehow in sharing in these poetry readings, we do get to taste each other's lives, and it's a great pleasure, especially to hear the students this morning. I'm looking forward to more of them. From my window, Spring sets the mind drifting across the lawn to borders ruffled with daffodils in early mornings when the milkman rattled bottles and I walked to school along a fence covered
covered with sweetheart roses, intermingled with honeysuckle around the silk property, where the fruit of an old mulberry tree will be eaten next August by chickens, hogs, and children. And my second one is frog music, and we're getting a lot of frog music with all the water. Frogs by the ditch and tree frogs sing until daybreak, and when it rains, rain frogs and bullfrogs holler louder at Steel Trap Bay. As the river overflows its banks, the shad frogs and sheep bell frogs tear loose in the night like a steam mill. In the sound of many waters, frogs spring into every song. Thank you. Mouse Stein is the next reader. Uh, this is a poem to the Hudson River. I guess you all know it, right? These are my little streets lying near the river, the boats offshore and the black gulls flying. Very few people here. Oh yes, there's a dog with his master right by, a man with long hair and his son beside him. The buildings are old, the stores are wrinkled, and the passing faces are crushed and vacant. I want to live here and never go home. When my shirt sleeves rolled and my tie torn off and the wind in my hair. To grow old here with a lean bearded face and an oil stained rug in my room. And to walk downstairs the angle of curve, the muscle of stone to the heart of a doorway. The world that I know is not like the river with its vision of light and its live, angry smell. Dia Rowe is the next reader.
Mage eyes follow, tedious miles thy glow. Bound to Herod, five mile tent, ye denied to show. Beacon for the sages, resurrected in nativity, pageants, canvases, and poets' pages. Beckon unto all peoples, all nations, all ages. Heavenly glory, all delight, glowing guide, guide all to the Lord of light, Lord of life. Lord babe, Lord babe, God child, bless us upon this Christmas tide. Uh, Donald Lev. Cut out, tear off, throw out, like a dog 